Hello, everybody. My name is Jack Jablonski, and I am a member of the AI Success Team working out of our Chicago office. In today's learning session, we're going to talk about visual AI. Today's presenters are Rajiv Shah. He is a data scientist at Data Robot, where his primary focus is helping customers improve their ability to make and implement predictions. Previously, Rajiv has been part of data science teams at Caterpillar and State Farm. He has worked on a variety of projects from a wide ranging set of areas, including supply chain, sensor data, actuarial ratings, and security projects. He has a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. We also have Ivan Deschow. He is a deep learning engineer at DataRobot on visual AI team, working with a few exciting features for a 6.3 release. Ivan has worked as a data scientist and engineer at McMaster Car Supply and McKinsey and Company, where he built production pipelines for neural networks for search engines, fraud detection systems, and satellite monitoring for agriculture. Also keep in mind, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A throughout the session, so please feel free add to, to add your questions during the session within the question dialog box, and we will address them in order. We'll also have some time at the end to address them as well. As a reminder, all of these are recorded and available on the community website, and if you have additional questions, you can email us at aisuccess-webinars at datarobot.com. Now I'll hand it over to Ivan. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. So today we're going to go through the goals of the webinar, and then we're going to jump right into the case studies. Um, so I, I really like to have the learning be grounded in lots of real world examples. Uh, and I think it's just more fun and the learning will stick with you better if you can sit next to me in the driver's seat and we can go through these projects together, uh, actually taking a look at this image data, seeing what data robot can do. Um, and hopefully you'll just have a lot of different examples uh, when this webinar is done that will stick with you in your mind. Uh, and then we'll go to questions like Jack mentioned. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about the goals of the webinar. So it would be great if at the end of this, uh, you're able to use the image insights in DataRobot uh, to identify scenarios where you can improve your data or your models. And, um, and when I say image insights, I mean, that DataRobot has a number of features built into our visual AI product that help you understand what's going on. So when you're trying to build an image model, you've got all this image data and you wanna build some kind of system, some AI to make predictions, you know, it's not enough for us to just be able to let you click a button and give you a model. You need to be able to understand what is my model looking at? What is it learning from? Um, how can I understand things about my data? And DataRobot makes that um, really easy to uncover. So when, I, when I'm referring to image insights, I'm basically referring to the suite of features that DataRobot has uh, to help you understand your image data and the models that we help you build with that data. So this will be things like our activation maps, our image embeddings, our baseline image model. And I'll go ahead and explain um, an overview of what each of those things are once you're able to see it. And the second goal of this session is you have an idea of what action to take next once you've identified those scenarios. So it's one thing to be able to uh, know that something fishy is going on or something good, but I want you to ask of, oh, where, what can I go next? And either that's because you remember, oh, when, when Ivan ran into this situation in this webinar, this is what he did, or you think, oh, I don't even remember what he did, but, uh, but I know that I can go look it up because this seems familiar. Uh, so at least at least knowing that you can take an action uh, is important. So uh, yeah, and, and and just one extra bit of comment. I'm hoping to make this uh, really accessible, um, both to the people who are familiar with the platform or who are you know very familiar with working with image data. I also want to make this accessible to those who are just dipping their toes into working with image data, um, or maybe I've worked with image data outside of DataRobot, but I've never seen DataRobot, um, and also accessible to those people that um, maybe don't have that much data science experience at all, or for the people that are just, um, you know, Zoom bombing this meeting and, and just got here randomly. I wanna make sure that they learn something as well. So let's dive right into the cases. So, in this first example, I'm gonna show you an example of using DataRobot to build an image model where everything seems to go right. And this will give you a nice preview into some of these insights that you can get about your data and your model. So the case is, you're working for a grocery store chain, 
they want to be able to identify when they're stocking out of items and produce and they want to be able to do this in real time uh, so that they can keep uh, produce on the shelves longer and they don't want to uh, have to have a person running around with a clipboard uh, the whole day. So our image data is going to be lots of images of many different varieties of produce and we're trying to classify them. So let's actually jump over uh, to a data robot project. And for those of you that have uh, never seen the product before, just to want to show you quickly, basically you can upload your data, you type in what you want to predict. So in this case, this is the class. We can see if we look at um, our data here, we open up class. We've got lots of different classes we could predict, peaches, yellow onions, cantaloupe, et cetera. And what we're going to do to predict the class of the image is feed in the image itself. So we've got lots of pictures of, of produce, some handheld, some not, and also some packaged foods. And so once you've uploaded this data and you've entered what you want to predict the class, you can hit start. And that'll kick off um, a whole series of um, uh, things you would normally do with any data set, like creating a holdout set, uh, you know, doing all your partitioning, doing some exploratory analysis, um, helping build some of the insights before you um, begin modeling. And then it'll actually kick off uh, a suite of models um, that will all compete against each other on a leaderboard and see which of those models does the best at predicting what it is uh, that's in the image, what the class is. So it's, we have a whole, uh, oh, go on, Raj. Hey, it's, so I was kind of curious why you picked this example um, of all, the, the right, the grocery store produce. It's funny because you, you started with this. Partly because if you look at like the history of computer vision, right, this was a classic use case that IBM did like in the 90s when they were like rolling out this like computer vision, like, hey, we can use computer vision to figure out how stuff in the grocery store, and, you know, save time at checkout. I, I didn't know if you were aware of that or not, but yeah, it's kind of funny that, yeah, we've come back to this use case. Um, let's, uh, let's say that I was, let's say that I was, uh, <laughs> right. I, 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 I picked this example because I love the image embeddings in this, mm -hmm. uh, project and I couldn't find a way to squeeze it into the rest of the examples because in this case, everything goes right. So that's why I picked it. Well, I mean, it's a great example, right? Of a variety of different objects that everybody knows and sees that, yeah, that mm -hmm. a computer has to classify. So I think it's kind of a project that everybody gets. Um, so totally. cool. Okay. Cool, so, so let's jump ahead to after uh, autopilot has run, where all these models have trained. And let me show you some of these insights that I, that I promised you to talk about. So here's our leaderboard. We see lots of different models and we see the loss. So the ranked by loss, lower is better. And we have you know, different contenders. We have logistic regressions. We have some Keras models. We have some light GBMs. Uh, one insight that I want to point out specific to visual AI projects is this baseline image model. The baseline image model is going to not do anything fancy. It's going to just look at a patch of the image or just the whole image and try and say, does this brightness of this part of the image correlate with my target? Can I use the brightness of a certain patch to predict my target? And that's all it does. The reason why I point this out is it's always great to have this baseline model in here because it gives you a floor of your, um, your accuracy or, or I guess a ceiling of your loss, right? We can see that the baseline model compared to the other models does really terribly. The loss is really high. Um, and so that's, that's, a, that's a good thing for our project. This lets us know, okay, these other models that are more complex are actually learning something. Um, so that's one insight that I wanna point out. Um, and actually, I'm going to change this to balanced accuracy, so it's a little bit more interpretable. Uh, this is basically saying that, you know, 95% of the time, this top model is able to guess correctly the, the class of the uh, grocery item, which is pretty remarkable. So in Data Robot, we can then click into this model and we can look at some more insights. So let's take a look at the activation maps. Now, the activation maps are going to show where this model is looking in each image to understand, uh, to, to help it make a prediction. So where is it looking to know whether it's a watermelon or a jug of soy milk, et cetera? I'm gonna turn on this co color overlay. This is just built right into the platform. We can see, it's awesome, right? We can think of, if we were trying to identify what these things were, what would we look at? So you see, okay, it's looking at 
one part of this mushroom or a certain part of this mushroom when it's looking at the soy milk it's it's focusing in on oh the you know the soy leaves on the front of the packaging or perhaps when it's looking at this beet it's saying oh you know there are lots of things that are round but a beet has this particular kind of place where the stem was and so that's what i'm going to focus in on so that's what the activation map showed they're showing where the model uh is looking you can see ah this texture of this pineapple might be really predictive or oh look for this cabbage the way that the you know this leaf of cabbage the you know the the veins of the cabbage splinter out that might be really characteristic of cabbage that's what the model's looking at to make a prediction so that's our activation app so we see okay it's looking at sensible things it seems like let's take a look at our image embeddings this is the last insight that i want to show you and what this is going to do is this is going to show a two-dimensional representation of the similarity of our images so after the images have passed through part of the model, they're, they're transformed in a way that um, extracts certain uh, features from them, um, such as, oh, do they contain certain objects or certain shapes or certain patterns? And then that's used uh, in combination with some dimensionality reduction to take this high dimensional space and bring it down to two dimensions where we can look at it. And you can see that you know there's different ways in which similar images are classified together. We have this whole island of soy milk, uh, an island I would love to be stranded on, honestly, um, because we can see these cartons are you know pretty similar. We've also got some interesting observations with this image embeddings. Take a look at how we've got all these round red fruits over here, got these round yellow fruits over here, and then in between them, right, we're slowly transitioning by adding in a little bit more red as we go through peaches and nectarines and beef tomatoes and red delicious until we get to regular tomatoes. So we've got this smooth transition from yellow uh, to red round fruits, which I really love. Um, another thing that's interesting is all of the um, fruits and vegetables that are kind of long and ob you know, oblong are over here. Um, together, the zucchinis, carrots, uh, bananas, and even some of these handhelds because this person's fingers look like carrots. Um, and uh, in case anyone was curious, it's what you get when you blend a zucchini uh, with a lime. Uh, it's it's not a limousine. It's not a zumbini. Uh, a terrible. Grape. It's indeed a watermelon. Um, so this watermelon's in between the zucchinis and the limes. And what I love about that is that let's zoom in a little bit. You can actually see, oh, a, just like a lime, but it also has characteristics of a zucchini in these long. Uh, dark green lines on it. And, you know, the embedding is able to pick up that, which I think is, is the coolest thing I'll show you all day. So, Rajan, anything else you want to add to this? No, this is great. And I think we'll probably get into this as we go in. So, one thing I just want to remind people, like, in this short kind of demo, like, without any code, just how much code and how complicated it is to do this on the back end, right? I used to teach people kind of how to do this in Keras and right before that you'd have to go to like Theano. And I mean, it's a ton of work to manually code out and to build out all this stuff. Um, the, now the second thing is, and maybe we're gonna dig into this as we go on, when you're looking at the embeddings, how much of it is just observing what's going on versus bringing your own ideas of what the embedding ought to be looking like? Does that make sense? Like, does that make sense? Uh, I yeah. yeah, 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 I mean, well, do you mean, sorry, do you mean like referring to the fact that like, it's sometimes it's kind of like reading the tea leaves where you can see what you want to see? Or do you mean oh, like how, how much should this be exploratory versus targeted searching for something? Well, a little bit like, right. So the, the patterns of the round and the, the round objects going, you know, from one color to another color or kind of this mixture of objects. I mean, should we be looking for this kind of stuff all the time? And if not, is that kind of an indication that, you know, our network's missing something or? Mm, yeah, I would say that, you know, if you have an intuition about, you know, ways in which your, your classes of images are gonna be very different, you should expect mm -hmm. to see some regions uh, separated and how clearly those regions are separated is gonna, you know, be based on how different they really are. So I, yeah. I think it'd be fair to say, you know, if I was classifying uh, this data set and I didn't know what the embeddings was gonna say, I think it'd be fair to assume, hey, all of these packaged cartons of soy milk, these should definitely be very dissimilar from everything else. But mm -hmm. it makes sense to me that, you know, round fruits, 
of different colors are more similar to each other. So even if they might have their own little region, they're still going to be much closer to each other than they are to the soy milk or even to these yeah. carrots or bananas. So and, and this also makes me think that maybe I want to just build a separate classifier for cartons versus the other pieces too, instead of doing it all in one model. Totally. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, definitely you know as we all know the data science model building process is pretty iterative and this might be a step where you actually take this out of data robot and you say hey i actually want to separate this and build two different models and so one model can just focus on the produce one can just focus on the cartons and what's great about data robot is it's actually pretty easy to build your own training set to do something like that so you could just manually drag you know 30 images of soy milk into one folder drag 30 images of produce into another, put that into data robot and have a pretty accurate model that would separate this because the problem is so easy. So um, that, that's actually possible. We've, we've done things like that uh, for our own internal testing before. All right, okay, we'll uh, keep going. Okay, this is great. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so this is an example where everything goes well. Now you're a little bit familiar with the image insights that we have. So let's move on to, um, our second case, which is plant seedlings. So let's say that you work with agri agricultural growers. They're trying to monitor weeds. Um, they wanna know the prevalence of them. And so they need to be able to identify plants they wanna grow versus the weeds. Maybe they even wanna build some kind of IoT uh, bot, some kind of system that's gonna, you know, they can drag along at the end of a tractor and, and spray pesticides on, on weeds uh, if they detect a weed or not, if they don't. Um, and so our image data set that we're going to look at is going to be identifying different species of baby plants. So let's jump over to that. So in this case, I've already run autopilot. I already have my leaderboard. So let's dig in. We've got our top model here. It's a Keras model. When I look at the balanced accuracy, so just for context, there's about 12 different classes of seedlings here. So 85% of the time, it, it's correct. This is okay. Seems like there's a lot of room for improvement, but it's learning something, right? So let me dig in then. I'm gonna take a look at our confusion matrix and see, okay, are there, are there classes it's commonly confusing? We see along the diagonal, these are the correct guesses. And the first thing that pops out to me is, huh, this is our biggest red dot. So let's look into this. This is loose silky bent and black grass. It looks like it's getting these classes confused. And so for me as a data scientist, I would say, okay, if this is what my confusion matrix is saying, let me take a look at my activation maps and let me look at these two classes of plants, loose silky bent and black grass. So I'll go back uh, to the activation maps. See, loading here. I'll turn on the rainbow overlay, which is my favorite way of looking at it. Do you, okay, do so you always got, go to the color overlay? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> unless the images, unless the images have a lot of rainbow colors in them, in which is confusing, and then I'll do the black and white overlay. Okay. Um, so we can see here. Okay, what is our model picking up on? Well, it looks like it's picking up on some leaves. Some leaves. That's good. That's good. What do we also see? Okay, we see these barcodes. That's strange. Uh, I didn't expect to see that. And, okay, so it looks like a good mix of picking up on actual shapes of leaves and these barcodes. Um, and the barcodes represent, I don't know, maybe 20% of our images. Uh, if they're even, evenly distributed, maybe that's not a problem. If in the real world, in when we're trying to deploy this model, our images also have barcodes, it might not be a problem, but it's something to watch out for. And let's filter by those two classes that I said I wanted to look at. So loose silky bent. So let's filter by the actual loose silky bent. Okay, interesting. I I I feel like uh, this is a case where we can see by the activation map it's actually looking at the barcode. Here it's looking at a part of the plant, but but also including some of the barcode. Okay, interesting. Let me look at the black grass. I think it was confusing it with. Okay, interesting. This one has more than half of us have these barcodes in it. And so now I'm a little bit suspicious. So I'm gonna take a look at some other classes and see, okay, what's the deal with this barcode thing? So look at common chickweed. Okay, much less prevalent, these, these images that have this potentially leaking barcode. 
or let me look at this class scentless maybe okay much less prevalent so okay so this is making me suspicious that there's something going on with loose silky bent and the black grass where they're using a lot more of the barcode and also something i might notice is look it looks like this looks more like a grass as a as opposed to having fatter petals and so it looks like it's just a harder problem there's less of the image that has this plant in it because the loose silky bent and the black grass are these thinner kinds of uh, grasses so that seems like it would make the problem harder so okay i i'm i'm now thinking the barcode might have something to do with it let's just shoot over to the image embeddings just to see if there's anything from it we can glean and as raj was saying am i going in with expectations well i might expect to see some of my classes that are uh, classified correctly maybe grouped together um, some of these other ones maybe i expect to see the black grass and the loops silky bent together um, Okay, interesting. So if I were to try and make sense of this, I'd say, okay, here's some image where it's really close up, maybe even a little blurry. Here's an area where the leaves matter, there's a lot of green in the image. Here's a kind of no man's land with a lot of rocks and maybe really thin plants. And we see that, okay, there's a decent distribution of ones with uh, barcodes in it. But what's interesting is that, okay, oh, loose silky bent, black grass, black grass, black grass, black grass. Okay, so it seems like I've found a patch common wheat of, of, of black grass and loose silky bent here that all have this, this thing in common of a lot of gravel, a lot of barcode, not a lot of plant. And so this is kind of an area where it seems like, according to the confusion matrix, I have an, an area for an, an opportunity for improvement. Um, so yeah, so to, to, to so do you filter this by class? In this situation. Uh, you can, ooh, yeah, you can. That's a great idea. Two heads. Oh man, nice Raj. Yeah, so look, here's where all the black grass is. I don't typically filter embeddings uh, by, like, that's not the first thing I think of to do. Um, okay, interesting. So we've got some obvious loose silky bend over here. And then we've got some confusing loose silky bent over here mixed in with the black grass, which is all kind of over here. Nice. So this is a way that we use a combination of the confusion matrices, which are available for all data robot projects, to lead us towards looking where to go in the activation maps. The activation maps gave us some, some intuition that helped us when we looked at the image embeddings, and also the filter helps us. And so now it seems like I have a pretty good idea of how I could improve my accuracy on this data set. And that would be to maybe take this outside of data robot, figure out how I could improve these classes. Do I need to go back and collect more data for these classes without barcodes or from closer up? Um, do I need to maybe just crop the existing images that I have to remove these barcodes or to zoom in on the, on the grass? Uh, this seems like a, a pair of classes that I have a lot of uh, opportunity for. So that's where I would dive in if I wanted to improve my model and then bring it back to Data Robot and see what I could uncover then. So Raj, any any thoughts on this? <laughs> I, have, I mean, so it would be cool, right? To be able to kind of almost filter your data set on these embeddings so that way you could identify like the characteristics of the images that are causing the most problems. Like I'd almost want to build a classifier to predict which images are in this set over here, right? Versus, mm -hmm. you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, so that way I could figure out like, which are the ones are that are higher quality pictures? Like, which are the ones that don't have much of the image and maybe I need to filter those out of my data set or have the people go back and kind of redo those, if if that makes sense, depending on kind of how your project is set totally. up. Totally. I mean, totally. this is where- Totally, right? yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, and I don't oh, know if you're going to talk about this later, but it often, right, often the workflows for when you're doing this images is you start with some images, you kind of take a look, understand what's going on, but then you use that to go in, in a semi-supervised type manner to then go and find a lot bigger images and start working through that just because it's just takes a lot of effort to label images. So if you can kind of bootstrap it with a classifier, that's often kind of what people like to do as well as right identify images that are uncertain and go and manually label those totally totally uh, yep. yeah i totally agree and 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 it brings up an interesting point about the process right it, i could have just looked at these images raw 
outside of data robot and just with a magnifying glass just see you know or or sort of okay. set them down in front of me like tarot cards and just say like what do i see like do i see any patterns um yeah. and maybe i would have noticed some similar things but by putting it into data robot and building models from it it makes it so much easier to actually get to the important findings um, mm -hmm. because we can look at the confusion matrices, because we can look at the image embeddings. And so, yep. you know, it's, it, it seems obvious sometimes after you discover it, but that process of discovery, when there's a thousand different directions, you could be slicing and dicing your data. Um, you know, you, you can't look at every angle. And so prioritize what to look at. That's going to be the most impactful, which I love. Yeah. No, I mean, it's a great point, right? That's what we do with tabular data all the time. Like we, we drop it in, we look at the feature importance, the feature impact, and that helps us to kind of focus in on what areas. Um, so yeah, no, I totally get it. Yeah. Um, all right, more stories. Okay. Raj, <laughs> okay, uh, is, there, is my audio fine, Raj? Did you want me to call yeah. in instead? You're doing okay. It was dropping a little bit, so I didn't know if we were, if it was gonna be a problem, but it seems like it's been okay so far. Okay, okay, feel free to cut me off if if so. So let's take a look at um, our next case. We're just blazing through examples. Oh, sorry, just to wrap up this one, I forgot about this slide. So our observation was we have a confusion matrix with some commonly confused classes. The action is, okay, let's look at the activation maps and do some filtering, or look at the embeddings and do some filtering. And when we have an observation that, hmm, maybe we're overfitting on this barcode or some extra gravel, our action can be, hey, let's crop our photos, let's go back to the drawing board, get different photos, resample our data, maybe as Raj was saying, build a simple classifier to exclude those. Um, so just to highlight our observations and actions. Uh, all right, so third case, car damage. So let's imagine we work for a car insurance company, we're processing claims for damage, and customers are sending us photos of their damaged cars, and right now on our systems, we're not really using these images, we're just storing them. Sometimes we use them for manual review, uh, but we wanna build some kind of system that can help sort these claims better, maybe help verify uh, some of the damage amount. Um, and so we wanna build a pilot where we say, hey, can DataRobot even identify damaged cars versus uh, undamaged cars? So that's the context. Let's jump into our project. So we've run autopilot, we've got a full leader, Board. Um, I look at my, so just for context, we've got blenders at the top of this leaderboard. Blenders take multiple models and average the scores together or train a simple classifier on multiple models. I'm going to ignore those for now. You can always get better scores by using blenders, but for iterating and looking at insights, it's helpful to look at the standalone models um, uh, because the, it can be a little bit clearer what's going on and it's faster to train. So my top non-blender model is this ENet. Okay, I prefer to look at this binary in AUC. So high 90s, pretty good at classifying whether a picture of a car. Um, and we see that our baseline model uh, is terrible. So that makes me feel great. Uh, so it makes me feel like we're actually learning something. So my process would be, hey, let's jump into this model. Let me look at the activation maps. And what I'm expecting to see is that the model should be focusing on areas of damage, right? Makes sense. Um, and true to form, I'll turn on this rainbow color overlay. Okay, so here's lots of pictures of cars, damaged and undamaged. We're gonna head, go ahead and filter at the outset. Okay, cool. So looks like it's focusing on this broken tail light, also focusing on the side door. Maybe it's damaged, I can't tell from here. Oh, look, looks like this hood and this tail light's damaged, just focusing in there. Okay. So we see the, the model focusing in on parts of these cars that are damaged. That's great. We see it picking up on dents. Sometimes even just looking at parts of a car maybe that are frequently damaged, like the hood of this car, even if it's not damaged in this particular example. Okay, this headlight is damaged and we're zooming in on there. Great, I feel pretty good about these activation maps. I feel like the model is picking up what it should. Let's look at the undamaged cars. Okay, interesting. Look at, looks like it's picking up on maybe looking at more of the whole car which would make sense you know if, if it's trying to evaluate whether there's any damage it would need to look at the whole car to figure out if there's any spot on it that had damage looking again at the hood the siding okay so there's areas that are frequently damaged okay so this all looks good our adc is good it's much better than the baseline model the activation maps are picking up on what i would expect and seem like there should be signal in it we could just walk away 
we could deploy this model and have been none the wiser. But let's take it one step further. Let's take the image embeddings uh, to reveal something that uh, that might that might be surprising. Spoiler alert: there's going to be a, a twist. So we see our image embedding. Uh, there's okay, maybe roughly two clusters, but definitely a lot in the, in between. I definitely my eye is caught on some of this more egregious damage over here. This looks a little bit less damaged. Let's verify that with um, with taking a look at our filters. So, um, okay, so we've got our damaged cars over here on the left, lots of different damage. Okay, makes sense. Let's look at our whole cars. Okay, we've got whole cars. And what I find really helpful is when we're looking at image embeddings, let's look at the border between two clusters to see which ones are, are sort of in between these classes. And let's also look at the extremes and see what might be instructive about that. So when I look at my damaged cars and I look at the, the extreme very far away versus the, uh, the close to the border, um, what do I notice? What do you notice? First thing that jumps out to me is, huh, looks like these are some, you know, really close up images of cars. And these are more zoomed out. Okay. And it even seems like if you were to ask me whether this is damaged or not, I couldn't tell you based on this image from this far away. So it looks like maybe these are harder to classify. And it makes sense, they're over in this cluster. Okay, so it looks like these are really zoomed in. These are kind of zoomed out. Huh, interesting. Does that pattern hold true for our whole cars? Okay, we've got super zoomed out photos over here. Ah, and look, super zoomed in photos over here. Now, this is interesting because it looks like not only is our embedding showing that there's undamaged cars over here and damaged cars over here, but it's also separating it along whether or not we're zoomed in or not. And it makes sense that zoomed in pictures look more similar to each other than perhaps zoomed out photos. So this is where I might start to worry and say, hmm, if, if our model is learning, whether something's zoomed out or not, as opposed to whether it's damaged or not, that's that's very different um, than what I want it to be learning. And I could imagine a scenario in which, let's say a customer is um, you know, submitting a claim and they take a picture of their damaged car from far away and our system incorrectly labels it as undamaged. That would be a problem. Or perhaps a customer could learn, hey, whenever I take a photo of my car from close up, whether it's damaged or not, the system like sends me a thousand dollars. So we don't want people to learn that either. So this is an example where I'd say, let's take off these filters. We actually might need to go back to the drawing board and say, hmm, how can we sample our classes better so that we have more example of, of undamaged cars that are zoomed in and also more examples of damaged cars that are zoomed out. And this might go to, you know, the way we collect our data. It looks like these are a lot of stock photos of cars, maybe straight from the internet. These look like they could be from the internet or maybe they're from our own internal database of, of what customers have sent us. So this is another case where we wanna go back to the drawing board, either resample our existing data, grab more data, maybe crop our existing photos um, to give more of a balance of zoomed in and zoomed out. And we only knew this by taking a look at these image embeddings. And it's not something we might've spotted if we were just looking at all the images together, or even if we just looked at our activation maps. Yeah, no, that's another killer story. I mean, I like it. And especially the kind of the notion of iterating, right? Is, is we kind of build these models. Sometimes we take the insights and just because we had a preordained idea of kind of what we wanted the model and what we thought the data was gonna do, that we don't just kind of follow that, but let the kind of the data and the model help guide us to better ways to improve and get better signal out of this. Um, so, no, I like this. Um, so Raj, I think just looking at the clock, Maybe we can skip the um, the next case and jump right to the Turkish power lines. It sounds good. And if people have questions, go ahead and send them in. Although I'm enjoying this a lot, so we're probably I'm going to try to let Ivan go all the way through the power lines example. But feel free to kind of ask, um, ask questions as well, and I'll try to work them in. Totally. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna. So just to recap uh, this car example. Um, 
Yeah, so our observation was that we separated into two classes. So let's look at the boundaries and let's look at the extremes. And once we do that, our observation is, huh, it looks like there's differences. You could call it leakage or you could call it some kind of overfitting. Differences in the images related to how the image was taken. And so our action is, okay, maybe we need to resample our images, crop them appropriately. Um, so that's the wrap up of that. The next case I was gonna talk about was uh, your manufacturer counting lots of little things like Skittles before you bag them. I'm gonna skip this because it's less interesting and uh, the last example is more interesting, but I think I might just turn this example uh, into a blog post on data robot community. Um, so, so no one has to feel like they're uh, experiencing any FOMO about this case. Um, Great, so let's jump into uh, our last example. And as Raj said, feel free to ask questions um, in the chat as you have them. So this is Power Lines. Um, so we're working with a utility company um, and they want to be able to detect whether there are power lines or not in these images that they're taking from um, a low flying airplane. Um, and perhaps the use case is they want to survey a bunch of land and uh, you know the maps are old or uh, the maps are unreliable or you know they want to check where a power line has gone down and they're not sure where it's happening. So our use case is going to be, you know, or, or, our data is going to be, we've got pictures of the Turkish countryside and it either has power lines in it or it doesn't. Um, and the reason why I wanted to show you this example is because this is where we can dive into where doing some advanced tuning on our models by actually diving a little bit into the neural network architecture, which Data Robot makes fun and not scary, uh, it can actually be helpful. And so I'm gonna walk you through uh, my own process uh, as, as uh, this is something that I did last week. And I'm gonna walk you through actually what I did uh, sort of in real time, um, show you how easy it is to iterate with Data Robot because it's so fast can sometimes answer your question and ask them, you know, in a, in one second rather than having to wait overnight. So we've trained our autopilot. We've got a bunch of models. I see my top non-blender model is this ENAN. And the log loss is already very, very good. Um, the This is incredibly low. So I would be happy to walk away from this now. Um, maybe it's even too good. But let's dig into uh, a little bit of the activation maps and see what is this model looking at. Now, what would I expect? Well, we're trying to identify power lines. So I expect to see the model focusing on power lines, following them. I expect to see maybe stripes in my activation maps uh, following the power lines. And I don't, I don't really see that. <laughs> so let's let's filter by the images that have no power lines in them. So what is our model looking at? Okay. For the ones that have no power lines, it starts off with just this kind of blob in the middle. Uh, and it says, okay, there's no power lines. That's fair enough. There's nothing to look at, right? It's just looking at countryside. Maybe sometimes it focuses on a little bit of gravel or a part of some maybe mountain range. It's tough to tell the perspective. Let's look at the ones that have power lines. Okay, so this is kind of following the line. This is just a blob. This is a blob. This is not touching the line at all. This is just a tree. <laughs> so, so this makes me feel like, huh, is my model really learning to identify power lines or is it learning something else? Similar to our other examples, is it overfitting on something else? So I'm suspicious. Okay, look, it's identifying part of, a, of some power tower. So this is where I would say, hmm, I actually think that I need to do some advanced tuning and actually want to change the level of feature that the network is looking at. Now, what does that mean? I'll explain in a second. Let me kick off some models so they're running while I can explain. But we can go to advanced tuning. And in the section that governs the uh, neural network that's helping process our images and turn a raw image into a numeric feature, uh, we've got some options. So We've, we see that we can use high level features, highest level features, low level and medium level. So I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna set, I'm gonna change these around a little bit. So I'm gonna set this to false, this to false. So I'm gonna only use the highest level feature. And I'm gonna begin tuning. I'll explain what this means in a second. 
Um, let me train a model where I only use a high level feature and everything else is false. I'm gonna kick off one where I'm only using a low level feature and everything else is false. And then I'm gonna do one for medium. And everything else is false. Okay, great. So I'm gonna kick these off. So these are running. Now, what does this mean? Let me just take a minute and show you this. Ooh, we're, we're, we're running right up on time. <laughs> so let's look at, uh, so this is an example of how we take an image and with a neural network, turn that into a set of numeric vectors that our um, models can use to learn from. And what happens is that over the course of these different layers, our image is shrunk down and it basically in each layer, it learns um, to identify certain patterns. So in the first layer, we're going to identify patterns of lines, dots, individual pixels, and that's what this layer is going to learn. And then the second layer is going to take those and it's going to say, okay, now that I've gone from a raw image to picking up on lines and dots, how can I combine the lines and dots to make more complex patterns such as triangles or squares or polka dot patterns? And then this next layer is gonna take those patterns and combine the triangles and squares and polka dots to make more complicated things like maybe the texture of a leaf or the you know, texture of rubber or um, you know, simple shapes. And basically by the time we get to this last layer, we're learning things like how to identify cats by putting together all of these individual pieces, um, cats or airplanes or chairs or whatever. So these represent our low level features, lines, dots. Our medium level feature would be things like shapes, um, squares, triangles, uh, certain textures. Our highest level features would be uh, actual objects. And so we can, yeah, this, is, this shows that. So we've got our low level features that's closer to the raw image, pixels, and our high level features, which represent more semantic uh, actual objects. Why is this relevant? Well, if we're trying to identify power lines, a power line is a very simple shape. It's just a, um, a line, right? And so to me, that's a low level feature. So I would expect that if I advance to a model like I did to use a low level feature instead of the default, which is these high, highest, medium level features, that my model would actually do better because what I'm trying to identify is an individual power line and I saw from my activation maps that my models weren't picking up on those. So now, oh, whoops, hey, didn't want to. Hey, that. no, I just wanted to highlight. So, I mean, I think this is a really useful both insight for kind of how um, convolutional neural networks work, right? Uh, this is often kind of taught when we're trying to understand what's going on. But one of the things that Data Robot and Ivan and the rest of the team have done is figure out how to take advantage of all this and allow us to create new features and improve our models. So, kind of the techniques that we're doing here are not really widely used in industry and are kind of some some of the kind of the secret sauce kind of data robot has added to help provide a bit more accuracy on the models. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead. Totally. Um, yeah, so I want to be mindful of time and, and we've got some good questions. So uh, I don't think I'll have time to walk through all of this. So you can do as much um, as you can. I mean, we can handle some of the questions yeah. afterwards. I We're not going to be sure. able to get the story from you on this. So. Um, yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Um, okay, so so basically what I'm seeing as these models are training and are finishing training is they're coming back and what I expect to see, right, based on this, uh, based on this that I showed you, is that a model that uses low level features will score better, medium after that, high after that, and highest after that. So I expect to see a ranking that goes low, medium, high, highest, because what I'm trying to identify, power lines, are a very simple uh, thing to identify uh, pixel wise. And so, mm, 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 mm. okay, so interesting. So I see down here, it's a little bit hard to parse with this, with this green text, but this is basically, this is our high one. This is our highest one. So, okay, the high is scoring better than the high. That's uh, uh, close to what I would have expected. Um, these are still training. So 
let me just jump ahead to um, an example where this was already trained. But at this step of the process, what I would have seen was here's our medium level one. Okay. And then this starred one is, is the one we started with. So, okay, medium is here, not better. I got my high, I got my highest. And my uh, low level one is going to be uh, here. Okay. So a little bit better than the one that I trained. Cool. So this is an example where I was able to use the uh, my understanding of what I thought the model should be picking up on to actually train a model model that was better than with autopilot by enabling low level features set to true. Now the next part of this is that I then trained a model with all of them. So that's this one. This had all of the features mixed together, and that did even better just by a little bit. And then I could I could have stopped there, and you know many great data scientists have, but I thought. There's something that's not right here. Why is a model that uses all these features, right? Even the highest level features, things that help distinguish cats and chairs and airplanes, why is that doing better? It shouldn't be doing better. It seems like that would only lead to overfitting. And so my next step was to go into advanced tuning and actually change not only the feature uh, levels, what was being used, but I thought, you know, I bet if I change the network, to be a more powerful network architecture. So this is bringing in a bigger and badder neural network. It'll actually be able to pick up on the signal from the features, from the low level features even better. Uh, and I don't think it's picking up on the signal correctly now. So I actually went ahead and I changed this to the next level up of complexity, which is the pre-ResNet 10. Um, I, I would say there's probably like 10 people in the world who know what all of these are in detail. Um, and on any given day, I'm either one of them or not, depending on whether I forget it, because it's really hard to keep track of. So we have some great descriptions of all of these and what they mean in our documentation. So uh, don't don't feel like you're left out if you don't if you don't recognize most of these, because uh, I didn't before I learned about them. So we've got the documentation. So I selected pre-ResNet 10 instead, which is a more powerful network. And then the cool thing is that once I did that and I trained, I actually saw uh, not only did all the models do better but the ranking of them from high to low was actually that the number one model was the one where the high level was false, the highest level was false, the medium level was false, and the low level was true. So this model is only using my low level features and it actually ended up scoring better uh, by you know, uh, a, a decent amount than the next model below it. And so my intuition about using low levels was good but I was only able to realize that intuition when I actually also trained a more complicated uh, neural network architecture. And so this is the, you know, the most advanced case. Um, uh, sorry, I had to rush through this, but this is just an example of how Data Robot makes it really easy to take your intuition to advance to models, to try out different things and have them uh, run. So, by the way, these are all done running, the ones that I kicked off. So they all took under two minutes. Um, and so you can iterate really quickly and, and actually see stuff come to life without having to do hours of coding in between and waiting overnight, et cetera, and ultimately get a, a, a model with a lot lower accuracy. And, um, and the very last thing I'll do is just to take a look at these activation maps. And so what do these activation maps look like? That's where we started. And so now do we see the lines uh, covering the power lines like we expected. This is, uh, the answer is uh, no, <laughs> we don't see that. So more mysteries to uh, uncover. Uh, I don't know what it's looking at. My best guess, given that it's looking between these power lines, is it's saying, hey, if I see lines and then I don't see lines in between them, because it's not some kind of crop lines or ridges in a mountain, then that means it's power lines, right? So it's looking in between the power lines as opposed to when I look at uh, something without power lines, you know, these lines are not power lines because they don't have space in between them. That's my best guess. Uh, so yeah, that, 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 that wraps up this case. Like I said, more mysteries to uh, uncover. Uh, thanks for coming to my TED talk. And yeah, let's jump on to the next uh, section. Uh, it, it, uh, Jack, did you it, want to? Yeah. Ross?
it makes me wonder like right so is it maybe the, the not like the, I'm curious here what the embeddings are. So the embeddings here are confusing. Maybe it's that the the actual kind of the model at the end is the one that's doing the being able to figure out the differences then um, between the power line. Not. Yeah, it's tough. Oh, we could compute them. Yeah, um, oh, yeah. There's ways. there's still more to uncover. Right? Yeah, but uh, we're definitely closer, right? We're we see that we're not overfitting on a giant tree, so that's definitely good, right? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so if folks have questions, feel free to put them in. We probably won't be able to get to them all, but what we can do is we'll do a follow-up um, email in the next day or so with the link to the recording of the webinar, as well as kind of answers to the questions, which we'll probably post on community. So that's the other places. Feel free for this particular webinar. We have that post inside community, so you can ask your questions um, there as well. All right. Um, so one question and we need to kind of I want to make sure we kind of hit this is well so what happens if you want those predictions in real time how would you do that mm -hmm. uh, so you so data robot uh, offers you to uh, deploy any model and if we want to get a sense of how fast it would be we can take a look at our um, model info time and look at the prediction time and so this is estimating that this model with this accuracy uh, you know, seven seconds to score a thousand rows. So that gives you an idea, uh, and you can compare the prediction time among the models. Um, and Data Robot has a whole a whole team dedicated to making sure that deployments are really easy. You can um, get those predictions in real time. Uh, Raj, you want to add on to that? You're probably more familiar yeah, no, with that. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm putting you in that position. Okay. Um, exactly. I mean, if you go over to the predict tab, you'll see that there's kind of just for any of the models that we have here and you click on deploy, there's literally with just kind of one click, you can deploy these out to a prediction server and then it has a nice REST API that you can use where you can just pass new images into it to get scored as well. And one other thing I wanna point out is the examples today, we just focused on just images, but one of the nice things with Data Robot and kind of how this has been built out is we can actually mix both images with traditional tabular data, your text categoricals, as well as with geospatial data um, as well. So I think we'll do a seminar on geospatial here in a couple of weeks, but one of the nice things is that multimodal data, data robot makes it really easy to handle that. Yeah. All right. You want me to, I'll ask you one or two of the questions and then Jack, you can tell us when we need to kind of, um, kind of. Yeah, we have time for probably two more. Okay. So one question was, um, could you also train the model when we're talking about those the, the car models, the car damage model, to identify zoomed in versus the whole car and use that to train the original model? Are you following that, Adam? Um, yeah, yeah. So we could do a, a two-part system where first we learn how to identify, you know, zoomed in or whole car. And then we could build a model on top of that to say, okay, given that it's zoomed in, is this damaged or not? Or given that it's zoomed out, is this damaged or not? Um, we could definitely do that. We just need to yeah. figure out how do we get our labels for that. Um, and you know, with Data Robot, uh, that seems like it should be a pretty easy problem. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I would imagine you could train a model like that with uh, with few data examples, few enough that you could drag and drop them yourself and, and make that model. Um, and then it would just be about, yeah, partitioning your data to separate um, after you've made those predictions and then making two different projects. And uh, yeah, I think I think that would that would, that would be a, a good option. Yeah. And I mean, I like that question because it shows you kind of the thinking that you can do with Data Robot, where you can start thinking about different ways when you, you start with that initial problem, but how you can pivot and kind of slightly change the problem to better solve it. Um, so I'm totally with you. You could also, because I'm I'm always in favor of building less uh, models if you can, just to simplify the whole um, deployment pipeline and to simplify your flow. So maybe you even decide to make four classes instead of two. So we have zoomed out damage, zoomed in damage, and you know uh, zoomed out undamaged and zoomed in undamaged. And so that will actually force the model to not be lazy about just looking at whether it's zoomed in or zoomed out. It still has to 
identify whether it's zoomed out or zoomed in, and it has to identify whether it's damaged or not. And it seems like a, an image model in data robot should be capable of learning that uh, given enough examples. So that, that's what I would opt for uh, if, I were, if I were doing that, just creating four classes instead of two. Great, looks like we could fit in one more question. Uh, should... um, so th there's a question here, how do you run a complete data set where the images are just a column of your data? Um, I don't know if you, do you have a quick answer for that, Ivan, or otherwise I can? Uh, where the images are just a column. So um, you can, I mean, you can talk about technically how to upload that, Raj. It, it's pretty, it, yeah. you, the answer is you can do it. It's pretty easy. And yeah, why don't you take it away? Yeah, and if you go to our community, I think Jack will mention it here. With this webinar, we've linked in some references inside community. One of them is a an example of using visual AI where we kind of show you how you can set up the data set where images are just one column of your data and then you have other categorical, numeric, other types of data in your data set. So it's it's fairly easy to do and we've got that documented out there in community. Totally, yeah, I mean, the one sentence answer is you have a CSV of your data and one column is just a path to your images and that folder of images just sits next to your CSV. And so then the CSV in that image column will just refer to the path of the image that should go in that column in that row. So it's yeah. really easy, yeah. And, and also just to answer this quick question, car damage model, that was supervised. So we're training with labels. Someone has asked that. Great, Ivan, can you go to the last slide with the community site? Totally. Great, thank you again, uh, Raj and Ivan, you guys did a great job here. I just wanted uh, to present this here, as Raj mentioned, uh, everything could be found on the community site. So um, as mentioned previously, you can reference this particular learning session, um, previous ones, and register for future opportunities at community.datarobot.com. It's also just to keep in mind, it's a learning center where you can collaborate and share ideas with fellow peers and customers and data robot experts beyond visual AI. So there's a plethora of different types of topics and subject areas uh, around the product and concepts that you guys could actually look to engage in. And going forward for any additional questions in relation to this particular webinar or future ones, please email us at AI success hyphen webinars at datarobot.com. And again, you will receive a communication within the within the next day or two referencing this particular webinar and other ones. And you will also see opportunities for future uh, learning sessions that you could look to register for. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day and talk to all of you soon.